Good evening, good morning, good afternoon uh, to everybody. Um, I'm Angela Le. I'm the um, director of the Hong Kong Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, which is hosting this talk by Professor Sigrid Schmalzer. This is part of um, the institute, part of the activities of um, a collaborative project that we are doing at the institute, which is called Making Modernity in East Asia. It is about um, technology uh, and the making of modern East Asia. Um, today, we are particularly delighted to have um, Professor Sigrid Schmalzer to deliver a lecture for us. Uh, let me briefly introduce um, Professor Schmalzer. Uh, she is Professor of History at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, where she teaches Chinese history and the history of science. Uh, her recent publications include the prize-winning book, which I think most of you have read, an excellent book called Red Revolution, Green Revolution, Scientific Farming in Socialist China. She has also uh, published more recently a book called Science for the People, Documents from America's Movement of Radical Scientists, and also a book for children, it's amazing, um, called Moth and Wops, uh, Soil and Ocean, Remembering Chinese Scientists, Pu Song, uh, Pu Pu Long's, um, Work for Sustainable Farming. She has a current project, uh, which is on heritage and survival, the power of agricultural knowledge in the PRC. Um, I think most of us here who, who know her a little bit uh, greatly admire her endless energy outside the ivory tower as an engaged intellectual on important political and social issues. Uh, she's organizing a book series called Activist Studies of Science and Technology, being a founding member of the Critical China Scholars of the New Science for the People and serving as vice president in her faculty union. Today, she's going to talk about, um, the title of her talk is Connecting the Dots, a History of Systems Thinking in Chinese Agricultural Science and Politics. If you have read the abstract, I'm sure that you, you, you are um, completely fascinated by this talk. Um, I, um, so Professor Schmalzer will talk about uh, for, an hour, for about an hour, and then um, you can ask questions. And if you have questions at any time, please, please post your questions uh, uh, at the Q&A uh, part. You know, you can just click on Q&A and post your questions. And the Q and, and after the talk, um, the uh, conversation will be moderated by my colleague Izumi Nakayama. And um, the Q and A session will last for about thirty minutes. And if you have further questions, do not hesitate to um, post a Q and A. We will um, send the questions which are not addressed in this webinar to uh, Professor Schmalzer, uh, so that she could take a look and maybe she can answer your questions after after the. Uh, today's lecture. So uh, please let let's let uh, let us join let let let's join me in welcoming Professor Schmalzer. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for coming to this lecture today. And thank you especially um, to Professor Liang for inviting me. It's just a tremendous honor uh, to have this opportunity. Um, also, thank you to uh, Professor Izumi Nakayama for handling the Q&A. I also had a wonderful conversation with Dr. Xiaomeng Liu um, a few weeks ago uh, preparing for this lecture. And thanks also very much to Joan Chen for uh, all the logistical work behind the scenes. And if I've forgotten anyone, please um, forgive me. So I wanna start out today um, by introducing one example of the kind of thing that is really exciting me these days, known as agroecological systems. These are farming practices that conspicuously bring together different types of production in mutually beneficial ways, and which are known to have a longish history of use in China. And if I could just check to make sure, are the slides advancing properly? Um, 
Professor Nakayama or Professor Leung, can you confirm? Am I? Um, yes, we can see it. Yes. Okay, great. So you're now seeing the, the diagrams one. Excellent. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, so among these agroecological systems, I think perhaps the best known internationally is the dike pond system of Southern China. And since this will be a particular focus in today's talk, I'm just gonna take a couple minutes to orient us to this system. So the picture um, to the left, the top left, is beautiful and it is meant to be beautiful. One of the things that these systems are celebrated for these days is their aesthetic quality. The diagram at the bottom might be familiar to anybody who took the college entrance exams, the Gaokao in China in the 1980s. And I'm gonna get back to that diagram um, in a little bit, but I first wanna direct your attention to the upper right. Um, and this is a more recent effort uh, to uh, describe, you know, to explain the um, traditional set of agricultural practices involved in the dike pond system, really as an agroecological system. And here the key word really is system, because we don't make diagrams like this unless we're trying to understand the relationship among the various component parts. So in this particular system, and this is a kind of the most classic version of it, Ponds are dredged out from swampy bits of land and the uh, mud is piled around uh, to form dikes. On the dikes are planted mulberry trees. The mulberry leaves are fed to silkworms. Uh, the silkworms obviously produce silk, um, but also produce droppings that are fed to fish. Um, so the fish benefit from that. And then the key thing here that I want you to pay attention to is that there's a specific effort to close the loop. And so it's emphasized that the mud at the bottom of the ponds is then periodically dredged out um, because it's very fertile because of all of the fish dropping. So the fish are contributing fertilizer for the mulberry trees. And so it's a complete loop that's defined here. And so keep that in, in mind. <clears throat> So today these systems are celebrated as evidence that traditional Chinese knowledge is inherently ecological and rational. That's part of what's implied by the defining them as systems. They are taken as a model of human intervention in nature that is positive and sustainable. And so it's different from a model of um, environmental protection that would take areas aside and um, designate them as wilderness where people can't intervene. This is a model that recognizes that humans can uh, participate as um, you know, participants in an, in an e ecosystem um, and uh, uh, in concert with the uh, um, ecological principles. <clears throat> And for that reason, these systems have been very inspiring to proponents of what's known as agroecology, a branch of the field of the discipline of ecology that um, focuses on agriculture and promotes ecological forms of agricultural practice. Um, they, they're highly resonant with Xi Jinping's technocratic vision of ecological civilization, which I'll come back to later. And they're marketed. They're very explicitly and um, you know, unapologetically marketed for their beauty, for their culture, for their historicity, and for their potential to save humanity, not to put too fine a point on it. Secret, uh, may yes. I ask you for a minute? There Absolutely. Appears to, there appears to be some weird uh, black bar covering part of your PowerPoint. Uh -oh. Okay, you know what that is? That's my, um, yes. I didn't realize that was visible to you. That's the um, control panel. Um, that's too bad. Are you seeing it on the side too? Is that, uh, is that better? Yes, that's much better. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for interrupting. That's really, um, I, I definitely want you to be able to see the slides. Mm -hmm. um, so this quotation, um, I think, demonstrates the, you know, what I've, what I've just suggested, right? Um, the uh, um, way in which these agroecological systems are, are celebrated um, today. They, um, they're uh, celebrated as traditional, having distinctive ethnic and regional characteristics, developing in harmony with the natural environment, um, and having high scientific value and, and practical significance. So the political weight these agricultural practices now carry raise a number of questions that I hope will be interesting to all of you and especially to those who are participating in the Making of Modern East Asia project. 
Um, first of all, where do these systems come from? How has their conceptualization changed over time and across different knowledge communities? Uh, second, what is the relationship between the two most obvious conceptual ordering paradigms at work in this history since the founding of the PRC, that is Marxism and systems theory? And what is the epistemological and political implications of the, um, these ordering paradigms? Uh, then more specific to the Making of Modern East Asia project, I'm really interested that you're putting infrastructure at the center of this work. Um, infrastructure uh, is very important to my project. I'm learning to see it more that way um, after engaging with uh, the work that you're collectively doing. I'm thinking of infrastructure in some ways as the product of systems thinking. And so I'm thinking perhaps I can contribute to uh, the, the work that you're you're doing collectively in exploring uh, the um, systems thinking that has produced quite a bit of infrastructure in one part of East Asia over a number of decades. Um, I'd also flag that another of the um, mo making of modern East Asia's groups um, central concerns, is, that is everyday life, is also very important to the project. But I have to admit that I'm not, haven't really been able to do much with this um, yet. So if people have advice for me on that, um, they can also put that in the Q&A and um, that would be, um, you know, uh, can be shared with me afterwards, um, or you could share it with me orally today as well. I uh, would very much appreciate that. And finally, how to connect the dots. So my partner has this joke that um, all academic titles, at least in the Anglophone world, have, uh, have to have the format silly pun or alliteration colon boring description of project. And I'm afraid my title today is no exception to that. So the pun in my case, the connecting the dots part of the title um, is supposed to mean both the historical actor's interest in integrating different components to create productive systems and also my own effort to connect the different and sometimes quite scattered bits of evidence that I've been collecting and that I'm in the process of sorting through. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes um, talking about imperial era texts because this isn't the focus of my project, nor is it my area of expertise, but I do need to at least look at them because the historical actors who I am studying themselves refer back to these imperial era texts as evidence of the long history uh, of the use of ecological systems in Chinese agriculture. And so I need to know um, what to make of them for myself. And I'll note here as well, you know, some of these materials, quite a few of these materials um, are often used as well by historians in another way. And that is to track, um, the, you know, to, as evidence of economic advancement or so-called sprouts of capitalism in the late imperial era. So now this diagram, which comes from a um, historical uh, overview of Ming and Qing ecological agriculture, uh, the, in this diagram, the author is basically aggregating evidence that he's found from the Ming and Qing, or actually in this case, specifically from the late Ming dynasty um, in Huzhou and uh, Zhejiang province to create you know, a, uh, or to, to describe agriculture, e ecological agriculture um, in that time and place. Um, so it's the use of a modern systems diagram, just in the same kinds of modern sy systems diagrams that um, agroecological um, experts use today, um, but but um, projecting it back in time based on textual evidence. And so, you know, I wanna say this, I think this may well be an effective way to capture the practice of ecological farming in a certain place and time. It's not necessarily an effective way to capture the thinking of the historical actors about those practices. So I wanna make a distinction there. The author wasn't implying or, you know, claiming that this uh, demonstrated the, the thinking necessarily. I think they were really more interested in capturing the practices, but it's a tension between um, text and practice um, that I find very challenging. I know there are quite a few people um, in the audience, I'm sure, who can um, uh, who do this kind of thing better than I do. And if you have insights on, you know, how you uh, navigate that um, tension between text and practice, I'll be very interested to um, hear about it. But looking at this made me also think about um, an article that Francesca Bray 
published recently in the East's journal in which she used, um, she thought about the way that she uses operational sequence diagramming in her own anthropological methodology um, and looked back at early Chinese agricultural texts to see the ways in which those texts reflected a similar kind of operational sequence thinking. Um, and that made me inspired to think, well, maybe I could do something similar, create an agroecological diagram that you know, sought to reflect the thought process um, that, um, that's revealed in a specific text. So I'm going to share first the text um, and then my fancy diagram. And uh, you can let me know what you think of it all. But um, so this passage um, uh, dates from the late Ming, um, uh, sorry, mid, mid Ming dynasty. Um, and uh, it, um, you know, it may be that you all will see more in here than I see, but from what I can tell, there's not much in here that points to ecological relationships or an interest in ecological relationships on the part of the author. There is, you know, the fact that the um, pigs uh, provide the fish with food, you know, the pig droppings feed the fish. It's also noticeable um, and interesting to me that the ponds are giving the pigs a place, a cool place to live. Um, so we can think of that as a kind of energy transfer. And that's the kind of thing that might be highlighted in a, um, you know, ecosystems uh, diagram. Um, but other than that, I mean, I think if we were you know, to try to diagram this, I think money would have to be a pretty important component because to my eye, um, money seems to be the driving force. The logic of circulation is a logic of economic resource cir circulation. So this is the diagram I came up with. Um, so I have the uh, pig droppings feeding the fish, you know, an arrow there, the way you would make an arrow in an ecosystems diagram and the um, fish pond cooling the, um, the pig sty. Um, but other than that, the main flow here is the flow of money, um, you know, of, of income from the various, um, various components here to the um, cash boxes. Um, so that I see this as more evidence for an economic economic um, kind of logic than an ecosystem logic. Um, the, uh, one other example I'll share is from a late Qing um, gazetteer in Guangdong. Um, and here, you know, it's a little bit more straightforward um, and perhaps easier to imagine a diagram like these modern ecosystems diagrams. Um, we see the mulberry leaves are feeding the silkworms and the silkworm droppings feeding the fish. But here I note that there's no mention of the pond mud fertilizing the um, trees. So the loop is not completed, which is not to say that they didn't necessarily do this, but just to say that the author did not feel that it was necessary or important to highlight the way the loop is, um, is completed. And so when I drew it, you know, I drew it with the, you have the, um, the uh, silkworms feeding the fish and you have the mulberries feeding the silkworms, but you don't have that other piece where um, the fish are fertilizing the mulberries. Still, you can think of it as um, a kind of system in that you have two industries, um, one of which is reinforcing the other and they are then connected into a, a kind of whole. They operate, they are integrated and operate as a whole. So I'll come back to some of these questions later on, but again, for now, I'll just underscore the way this exercise highlights the difficult methodological issue involved in sorting out the relationship between text and practice. Um, and with that, I will leap to um, the main materials that I'll be um, looking at for this project, which come from the post-49 period and starting out right now with the Mao era. And here's where we're gonna find a lot of dots that I'm going to do my best to connect. Because what I've been noticing over the years of working on agriculture and politics in Mao era China is that everywhere we look, there's a tremendous emphasis on integration, which of course is a very central aspect of systems thinking. So I'm not gonna go item by item through this list. My point really is to show you just how many such items you can collect if you try even a little bit. I mean, this is by no means an exhaustive um, exhaustive list. And you know, my examples come mainly from agriculture, but it's certainly a phenomenon that exists um, 
everywhere and points clearly to what STS scholars call the co-production of scientific and political knowledge. So this, this principle of integration is operating in the scientific world and political world and, you know, the, these are not separate. Um, Looking at the list, I also want to highlight that the forms that integration took were not just material, but also social, political, administrative, and epistemological. So for example, in the three-in-one scientific experiment groups, which I talked a lot about in the Red Revolution, Green Revolution book, and other people have talked about um, as well, the idea was to bring together peasants, technicians, and political cadres who each had a different kind of knowledge so as to create an epistemologically diverse and robust revolutionary form of scientific practice. Farther down the list, um, the concept of integrated use, Tsongkhe Liyong, in which the waste products of one industry were recaptured to feed other industries. This is obviously a um, form of material integration and in that you know we could see that as the main kind of integration happening. The, the main point of Zong Ho Yong is that form of material integration of different industries. Um, but at the same time, um, it's also about integrating administrative spheres that have very different knowledge forms. So for example, the recap capturing of sewage water for agricultural and aquacultural purposes was said to integrate agriculture, urban administration, public health, and fisheries. And that form of administrative integration was seen as a positive outcome of this um, policy. And just as a, a side note here, I want to um, note that Jen Altahanger is working on a great project related to Tsong Ho Li Yong in the forestry and furniture industries. And I'm learning a lot from that project. Um, and Josh Goldstein's new book on um, recycling gives a very good understanding of uh, Tsong Ho Li Yong as it's um, applied in the area of waste management. Um, it's very worth looking into. So to go into some of the more specific examples, I wanna to return to the dike pond system and to the most influential of the Mao era analyses of this system, which appeared in an article in 1958 by the economic geographer, Zhong Gongfu. In this passage, he's describing the traditional system that we've looked at already. And we can see here his emphasis on production links. He's translating the traditional practices of Pearl River farmers into the language of socialist economic geography. And note as well that unlike in the imperial era texts I just looked at, Zhong is carefully tracing a fully circular system by showing how the fish ponds fertilize the mulberry trees, thus completing that cycle. So this is consistent with the other um, 20th century examples we've examined. But the system that uh, he was most interested in describing was a bit different um, because the practices had changed by the time that he was um, doing this research. Um, and though people continued to conceive of it and describe it as a mulberry silk fish pond system, you'll see that um, there's another major industry involved in this key diagram from his article and that's sugar. Sugar had grown in importance after the silk crash of 1926, and Zhong Gongfu was interested in resolving what had become a contradiction between the silk and sugar industries. So this chart is called a production links chart. Um, this term is, was commonly used by economic geographers and um, in geography textbooks by the late 1950s. Um, at the bottom, we see a physical depiction of a pond with fish um, between two raised pieces of land um, or dikes. The dike on the left is planted with mulberry, the dike on the right with sugar. And each of these production areas leads upward vertically in the diagram with the end products be becoming um, silk fish and sugar. And then various arrows demonstrate the ways that each of the specialty areas feed into one another to create an integrated system. At the top right, there's an indication um, that, you know, this is not depicted as a self-sufficient closed system, but rather these products are being exported out of the region. And that's also, I would say, consistent with the Mid Ming example um, that we looked at. This is, you know, this is not just seen as a, as a model of self-sufficiency. <clears throat> 
So Zhong Gongfu's article attracted some attention at the time. Others um, also wrote on this system in the early 1960s, um, but it really took off um, after 1980. In 1980, he republished his article with some revisions, but including that same diagram. Um, and you know, the diagram became what I think of as a, like the locus classicus for the identification of the Dyke Pond system as an agroecological exemplar. And it really was used as an exemplar. Um, the image on the right is taken from um, like a review book for people um, studying for the college entrance exams in the 1980s um, as the kind of question that might come up on, on the exam. So I wanna look at one more example from some other economic geographers who were employing a production links chart uh, to illustrate the functioning of, in this case of what were called zonghe uh, ti, which we can translate simply as complexes, but in which the principle of integration was very fully um, developed. So the text accompanying this diagram explains that the commune includes many different kinds of production departments, all of which are very closely connected. Vegetables and fruits are at the center of the production, but all of the components mutually benefit one another. So for example, the vegetable byproducts feed the pigs and the pigs produce fertilizer for the vegetables. And the article sums it up Thus, the other departments in the commune all revolve around the fruits and vegetables production, forming a mutually connected organic whole, demonstrating the special characteristic of bringing together the specialized development of fruits and vegetables on the one hand and integrated development on the other. And in Chinese, this is So what have we seen so far for the Mao era? Um, I think, you know, although many of us tend to associate the rise of systems thinking with the reform era for very good reason, and I'll get to the reform era in a little bit, nonetheless, we're seeing systems thinking was very important um, in the Mao era as well. Consistent with basic principles of dialectical materialism, Mao era political and intellectual actors emphasized holistic analysis, the connections, the relationships, the dynamic interaction and further integration of parts within a whole, um, you know, i.e. the creation of, of systems. And so much so that I'm gonna suggest, and I'll be interested what people think of this, that integration can be seen as a core political and scientific value alongside some of the other political scientific values that those of us um, you know, focusing on the um, history of science in the PRC have um, come to recognize like localism or self-reliance or mass mobilization, et cetera. Uh, now, I also want to flag, um, I've been benefiting from an article written by a scholar, Xu Yijie, um, who has argued that um, Mao era integrated use was environmentalist and laid the groundwork for the sustainable development paradigm of recent years. And I think there's a, a lot to be said in support of this um, argument, but I want to um, think more about it. I, I want to flag it now and come back to it once I've talked more about the um, reform era. But before getting to the reform era, I um, wanna look um, at the last couple of years, just zoom in on 1975 uh, to 1976, um, because it's in these years that um, in agriculture, I think in other fields as well, the dots start connecting um, more meaningfully. Um, and in particular, in this case, in these years, it's, it's in these years that we start to see the um, artic articles appearing, specifically talking about agroecological systems and defining these. I'll say later on, um, they start being called um, eco-agricultural systems. I think for the purpose of these, this talk, we can think of these as pretty much interchangeable. There might be, there's some nuance there, but um, just not to get confused that there are these two terms that are um, mostly interchangeable. And you know what I we're going to see the two articles that I am about to share is some vivid evidence of the role of Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought 
on the uh, development of the concept of agroecology in China. Um, I think this is consistent with um, what uh, Li Jingjiang has uh, found in her study of what she calls socialist embryology in the Mao era. So I want to look at two articles from this period. Um, the first is from 1975 by the agronomist Shen Hung Li. And uh, here again, I'm starting with the diagrams. We can certainly see the similarity um, or the, and the continuity in the whole use of these systems diagrams. Note here though, that um, rather than being called production links charts, these are called the structure of the agroecological system and the material cycles of the agroecological system. These are ecologists. I think may, the main difference is one of discipline, although it certainly does also mark a shift to more ecological thinking as a kind of hallmark of the um, 70s and, um, and beyond. Um, note also the inclusion of the human in the diagrams, um, whereas in the previous diagrams, humans were implicit actors behind all the production links. Here, humans are discrete components within a larger ecological system. So digging into the text, um, he um, quotes Mao, which is, of course, to be expected uh, during this period. This particular quote is um, often repeated. It uh, highlights the interdependence of agriculture, forestry, and animal husbandry. In this case, actually, Mao was quoting um, himself, quoting a Soviet agronomist. This gets frequently repeated um, and highlighted in terms of Mao's emphasis on the interdependence of these um, areas. Uh, the author also explicitly uses dialectics um, to understand agroecology, but then also even to understand the significance of traditional sayings um, like the more pigs, the more fertilizer, the more grain. Um, so there's a, an explicit um, emphasis on, on dialectics here. And the author um, takes the opportunity, um, also um, consistent with the political times, to criticize um, capital, what you know, he's referring to as a capitalist metaphysical approach where allegedly the relationship among humans cultivated land and production was understood in a very linear um, and limited way. Um, and he's arguing that uh, agroecology and understanding it systemically um, will provide a, um, you know, a more effective and better way of, uh, of understanding agriculture, better approach to agriculture. Um, the second article I wanna look at is by a very influential scientist named Ma Shi Jun. Uh, Ma Shi Jun was uh, notable in the Mao era in particular for his uh, emphasis on uh, his promotion of what's called integrated control of insect pests. Um, and that form of integration was really a methodological integration, integrating the method of biological control of insect pests, chemical control of insect pests, and agricultural uh, methods of controlling insect pests. And together, um, you know, if you brought these these systems together, it was thought that that would be the most effective, the most economical, and the least damaging to human health and the environment. Um, in the reform era, he becomes far more influential as uh, really recognized as the pioneer of eco-agricultural engineering. Um, and in this article, this 1976 article, we see him really bridging Mao era systems thinking in agriculture with this intensified focus on ecology, which is a hallmark of the reform era. Um, uh, he uses a lot of systems diagrams in this um, article, or quite a few, but um, the one I like um, the best and the one I had to share was this one where he kind of remaps the Mao's famous eight character charter in agriculture, which is usually presented just as a list of eight things, these eight specific areas of agriculture that needed to be modernized. Um, but for Ma Shi Jun, this was a great opportunity to show the relationships among these eight pra practices in terms of their mutual uses and mutual links. And so he uses um, the a systems diagram to describe the um, eight character charter. I think that's quite telling. 
digging into the text. So he quotes Mao on holism, he quotes Lenin on connections, and then he defines ecosystems in terms of those quotations. So again, very much using the um, the Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought at his disposal to understand and to emphasize the um, legitimacy of the agroecological approach. So um, moving now to the reform era, um, I, is that the, yes, okay. Um, moving to the reform era, I think systems thinking and engineering are widely recognized among people who uh, study this era as key pillars of the technocratic shift that happens at this time. And there, are, you know, I've listed just a few of the um, books and, you know, articles that uh, have given us this lens to understand this very important transformation in um, China's political realm. Now, systems thinking in agriculture maps, I would say, pretty predictably onto the development of technocracy in the reform era. So um, I'll talk about three different moments in the reform era, the uh, rise of agroecological engineering in the 1980s and 90s, um, in the early 21st century, the agricultural heritage movement, and more recently, uh, the rise of the rhetoric of ecological civilization. And in each case, we're really going to see the relationship between the um, agroecology and the larger political concerns of the day. Um, so for the 1980s, again, turning to Ma Shijun, um, who he's really credited with founding Chinese ecological agriculture, frequently, frequently cited, um, and often cited also are these four principles that he put forward um, to define ecological agriculture, that is integrity, harmony, circulation, and regeneration. These are the way that they're typically translated, so I, include, I use those translations. Um, in 1987, he wrote a book that that is still, you know, the main, uh, you know, the for kind of first text cited um, in work on agroecology, and he defines agroecology in terms of rationality and integration, harmonizing the ratios of agriculture, forestry, and livestock. So this, in, we're going to see an increased emphasis on um, harmony as part of the larger political emphasis on harm, harmonious development. Um, and we see in the second quotation, an emphasis on stability and sustaining high functionality. So this emphasis on stability is also something we're going to increasingly see um, in reform era approaches to agroecology. This is a very blurry diagram that I include just to demonstrate that these diagrams continue um, to be important. We can see a real continuity here. Um, I picked this particular one from his book because it um, is the one that should be familiar to us where that includes um, mulberry, silk, and fish. Note here, there's also methane ponds, um, which beginning in the 70s and then increasingly in the 80s and actually still today are um, a central item of interest for people who are doing um, ecological agriculture. Here's a less blurry diagram showing kind of a similar uh, concept, um, this one from 1998 uh, and published in um, Eco Agricultural Research, a journal um, in, also in the PRC. Um, and uh, here also I picked the one that has the mulberry, silk, and fish, and um, uh, notice it also has the methane ponds on the middle right. So in the early, the first decade of the 21st century, systems thinking in agriculture was further transformed by the emergence of the agricultural heritage movement. And I discussed this at length in my recent article on agricultural terracing, also in the journal Easts. Um, here, the emphasis is not on current or recent forms of agroecological engineering, but rather the systems that were considered, you know, that were created um, centuries ago and can therefore be considered uh, traditional. So it's benefited, this movement in China has benefited quite a bit from a larger project of um, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. China has been a big player um, in the um, Food and Agriculture Organization's Committee on Agricultural Heritage. And actually the um, author I'm citing here, Min Qingwen, was, um, has been a um, member of that committee in the FAO and been very influential there. 
So here we see the continued emphasis on systems thinking, especially on integration, including the kind of integration that goes beyond um, material exchange to include more abstract or even epistemological bridging. So for example, you know, talking about hybrid ecological systems that combine society, economics, and nature. Again, the emphasis on harmony um, here. And still more recently, we see efforts on the part of scientists to weave Xi Jinping's priority of ecological civilization into their work. And I wanna note here that ecological civilization is itself part of a kind of system or it's described um, as part of a system at the policy level. So it's Weiti, it's the five sphere general plan. Um, ecological civilization is one of these five interlinked spheres, the other four being social, economic, political, and cultural, I think, um, civilization. So they're all supposed to work together in this, this five sphere plan. So again, the co-production of scientific and political knowledge, I think is, is clear here. So stepping back and thinking about um, systems thinking across the eras and what to make of the continuities that we find, because I think there are some, some clear continuities here, um, certainly an emphasis on integration of mutually supportive components. And this, I think, you know, we can make the case for even in the imperial era texts that I shared, um, you know, whatever we think about the effort to make you know, make it out that these are um, kind of an ecosystem consciousness. It's, um, I think that the emphasis on integration um, and of parts forming a larger whole um, is, is clear. Economic logic is also central um, throughout uh, all of these um, eras that we've looked at. Um, it's, you know, the, the relationship between economy and ecology and you know, the, the, those words sound similar in English for a good reason, because the, their histories are entangled. Um, but it's clear that economic logic is central in the historical actors' own understanding of, of what they're doing when they're mapping um, these agroecological systems. Um, that said, um, I think that um, continuities can sometimes be overblown, and um, I do want to encourage us to think very carefully about how they are constructed and to what ends. So, you know, I, I think we need to hold, I'm holding as an open question, the extent um, to which we should identify imperial era texts with systems thinking and or ecological agriculture. Um, you know, I think there are clear differences um, from recent systems thinking. Um, and I think those differences deserve uh, careful attention, but I don't wanna reject the possibility that some commonalities underlie um, this thinking and, and really just sort through what it means when we find those continuities. Um, I do agree with Shui Jia um, that Mao era integrated use created an important legacy for reform era environmental policy. Um, I'm more concerned, however, with the specific kind of legacy, because to my eye, the continuity lies less in an environmental ethic and more in a commitment to systems thinking. I think the systems thinking is really the, the main continuity there um, between Zongha Leong in the Mao era and the sustainable development paradigm in the reform era. Um, and the strong focus on systems is important here. You know, it has ramifications. The systems thinking is not the only way to do, um, you know, create an environmental ethic, right? Um, and the strong focus on systems, I would argue, creates a technocratic approach, or at least supports an, a technocratic approach that privileges stability, not only ecologically, but also politically. And this does have um, the uh, tendency to intensify state power. And then finally, even if we accept the existence of continuities, the way they are constructed appears at least as significant to me. Both traditional Chinese culture and Maoism have been constructed as reservoirs of alternatives to dominant ideologies from the West that have pr proven unsatisfactory, and in particular, reductionism and capitalist exploitation. So identifying such alternatives has many positive implications. And you know, generally speaking, I uh, think it is a really good 
thing to do. You know, when we rightly question the dominant paradigms that we live with, it is very useful to um, and beneficial to look to other times and places uh, for inspiration to see that it's not, it doesn't have, the world ha- doesn't have to be constructed the way um, the world that we live in has been constructed. So that's a, a good thing, I think. But of course, you know, there's always, whenever we're constructing something as an alternative, um, it may also serve to obscure certain aspects of that history, um, including, you know, any reductionist or capitalist or at least developmentalist um, tendencies in those histories. So I want to step back now um, and speak a bit more abstractly, returning to one of the questions that I began with, which is what is the relationship between systems thinking and Marxist or Maoist dialectics? And this is a bit hard to set up because systems thinking itself is a very complex thing whose transnational history is a tangle of roots and branches, which includes ecology and cybernetics. Um, Its proponents have ranged from weapons engineers to pacifists and environmentalists. Um, So for the cybernetics end of it in China, um, especially the role of Chen Xuesun and other high-placed scientists, I'm learning quite a bit from Wang Hongzhi's um, work, a recent article. Um, But there's far more that I can hope um, that far more than there's far more in that history than I can hope to do justice to here. So I'm hoping for some tolerance um, on your parts, allowing me to paint with a broad brush just to get a basic outline that will allow me to ask some questions that I'm excited to ask and talk about. Um, So during the 20th century, especially during the Cold War, systems theory became popular um, in the non-Marxist world, certainly because of its explanatory power and engineering possibilities. Um, Also, um, in many cases, because it offered a critique of reductionism, a way of understanding the world in less reductionist and linear um, ways. And among some of its proponents, at least, also its potential to identify and encourage harmonious relationships. This is actually a term that, you know, comes up in some of that literature in the West. Um, In its attention to the dynamic integration of parts within a whole, we can think of systems thinking as having offered something of dialectical materialism, but without the political baggage that Marxism carried and that, you know, many in the um, non-socialist West were um, reluctant, right, to um, to embrace. Um, Now, in Mao era China, Um, Of course, um, there's obviously no need to, um, you know, resist or avoid um, the baggage of Marxism, quite the reverse. Um, In Maori China, you you know, the return of Chen Shui-sun from the U.S. in the 1950s provided a leader to promote the field of operations theory, um, one branch of systems theory. Meanwhile, systems thinking in a wide variety of administrative and academic fields gained inspiration from dialectics and other aspects of Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, as we've seen in some of the examples from agriculture. In reform era China, following some interesting debates about the relationship among systems theory and its sister disciplines, um, control theory and information theory, and the relationship of all three of these to Marxism, systems theory has been officially presented as compatible with Marxism and or derived from it. So it's something that um, people have been able to engage and with very directly and celebrate and use um, without a kind of sense of political contradiction. And this isn't surprising since, you know, core political values of the reform era state, including, for example, harmonious development are very well served by systems theory. So maybe there's no problem here, you know, and there's no contradiction between systems thinking and Marxism in China. We could see it as natural that people in the Mao era steeped in Marxism should have gravitated toward principles of integration and other forms of systems thinking, and that people in the reform era who sought to preserve Marxism as a guide for scientific inquiry, including as the most prominent example, Chen Xuesun, that they should have embraced systems theory explicitly and with confidence that it confirmed the validity of Marxism. But I can't help but think about this question from another angle entirely because of an essay written by Richard Levins 
um, is a Marxist biologist in the United States. I had the great pleasure of meeting him and getting to know him when I was researching the history of the old organization Science for the People. And when he and I and quite a few other people were involved in revitalizing um, that organization a few years ago. So Levins and Tian Shui Sun both have sought, both sought to preserve the position of Marxist dialectics in relation to systems theory. Otherwise, there are very different kinds of scientists with very different motivations. Um, what makes Levin so useful to me here is that his position as a Marxist theorist within a liberal capitalist context encouraged a very different kind of critical analysis than anything we would be likely to find among um, scientists like Chen Chia's son um, who were in, you know, kind of working within this state socialist country governed by a communist party. So this is a kind of familiar irony, right, in terms of the uh, the possibilities um, opened when you're, um, when your own um, political position is very different from the, the larger context that your um, political context that you're in. Um, and, you know, I think we can perhaps think of turning to Richard Levins and people like him as a kind of reservoir of alternatives in our effort to ask critical questions of PRC history, just as we turn to examples from PRC history, or for that matter, um, imperial era, uh, Chinese history, in our effort to question dominant ideologies in the West. So what does Richard Levins say about systems theory. Um, well, he says, compared with dialectics, it lacks a critical standpoint. He thinks it fails to recognize historicity and the universality of change while privileging static or harmonious states. Um, he thinks it does not encourage self-reflexivity, that it assumes the superiority of the quantitative over the qualitative. And in some ways, the reason for all of this in his mind is that it lacks roots in political struggle. It's different from Marxist dialectics in that it's not um, a part of this larger um, political struggle. So the, he's saying all of this, he's not referring to China in this, right? He's referring um, to the US in particular, but you know, um, the West more generally. Um, and he makes the argument that systems theory construes problems too small. And the example that he loved to give, um, and he's you know, brought it out in, in several different places, is that of the um, regulation of blood sugar. So he says a systems analysis of the regulation of blood sugar typically includes just the interactions of these different molecules, right? Sugar, insulin, adrenaline, cortisol, et cetera. Um, but what it doesn't do because it lacks roots in political struggle and isn't critical and isn't, um, you know, uh, interested in, um, you know, historicity and all of this kind of thing is that it doesn't place that um, regulation of blood sugar within an actual human body and think about the political and social context that that human body is living in. So he wants to imagine this all happening within the body of a factory worker um, who is experiencing um, intense labor pressures, using up sugar reserves as the, the, they're laboring. Um, and then the question is, is their job condition such that they can rest when they need to rest and get a snack when they get a snack? Because that's going to have a big impact on the interaction of all of these molecules. And then he goes further in some other places to say, well, what if um, the uh, factory is unionized and now you have a union steward who is doing a good job ensuring, advocating for the working worker and ensuring that they're allowed to take that rest and, and get that snack, that's going to have an impact as well. Um, and so, you know, what he's doing here is insisting that it's understood in this larger political and social context. He's opening up, he's breaking open that systems analysis and saying, if we're gonna talk about systems, we need to, you know, really make that a big, um, a big system. Uh, and he concludes, I think, in a very damning way, um, saying that systems theory is the attempt of a reductionist scientific tradition, ouch, right, to come to terms with complexity, nonlinearity, and change, a groping toward a more dialectical understanding that is held back by its philosophical biases and the institutional and economic contexts of its development. So, you know, then my question is, you know, having drunk from this reservoir that Levins offers us, 
um, can we revisit the examples we've seen and ask whether Levins's concerns about the limitations of systems theory hold true for PRC history as well? So, you know, on the plus side, I think we have seen examples um, of critical analysis. We've seen examples of the identification of dialectical relationships. We've seen, um, you know, examples of the recognition of historicity and changing political contexts. So we have seen some things that, that suggest that this, this systems thinking has some of that, um, you know, benefits from some of that Marxist dialectics that Levins would like to see. But I think, you know, Levins sets the bar considerably higher. And I think, you know, what, what I'm motivated to ask is what would be a corollary in the materials that I'm looking at to the example of unionizing diabetes? Like what would that move look like in the field of agroecology um, in PRC history? Where is there room to make agro-systems analysis bigger, more critical, and more engaged? Um, so I'm giving a couple of examples based on the work other people have um, been doing that's exciting to me where I think some of this potential um, is there. So looking at sugar production, since Zhong Gongfu looked at sugar production um, in that dike um, pond system, uh, Emily Hill's recent work, she's um, you know, ongoing work. She's taking the stuff that she did for Republican era history and moving it into the present day as well, accounting for the roles of the state, industry, social movements, popular culture, et cetera, on sugar production. I think that that can be done. Um, and um, Emily Hill's work, you know, I saw her present a paper where I thought that, it, you know, it, it could be going in that direction. Um, tracking changes in ecological relationships alongside changes in economic uh, relationships. I think this this feels extremely important to me. And here I'm really inspired by um, uh, Yu Huang's, the anthropologist Yu Huang's um, work, uh, maybe known to some of you. Um, she does this lovely self-action, self-reflexive action research where um, on um, shrimp farming in Southern China, she became a shrimp farmer and set up a um, economic cooperative of shrimp farmers and is really looking at the um, intersections between ecology and uh, economics. And I think a very um, exciting way, not coincidentally, um, you know, she and I have talked about um, Richard Levins. She's also um, also a fan. So uh, that's a it's a not not a coincidence there, perhaps that I find in her work some of the things that I um, I'm seeing Levin's calling for. Um, also, uh, you know, plug for uh, Alexander Day and Mindy Schneider's uh, work on political economy of alternative food systems, I think is quite helpful in this direction as well. Um, and then integrating agroecology and food sovereignty, the food sovereignty movement. Um, and here, I think that a, a really interesting um, and you know, very clear text um, that looks at that kind of integration is John Vandermeer and Yvette Perfecto's book on Nature's Matrix, where they very explicitly take agroecology. So they have an agricultural argument, an ecological argument, and a political argument in the form of uh, argument about food sovereignty and the um, social movements of small farmers um, and integrate um, all of those into a single, like one larger systems analysis. Um, and here uh, also John Vandermeer was a student of Richard Levin. So, you know, it's a again, perhaps not coincidental, um, not just perhaps, it's not coincidental um, that um, his work should reflect those same ideas. Um, and also, you know, known to many of you, I'm sure, is Yen Hai Rong's um, important uh, clarification about the um, food sovereignty movement in uh, China, really being much more attentive to stratification, um, economic stratification among uh, rural villagers uh, that is not as much, um, it's kind of, it's not as much highlighted or, you know, carefully worked out in the food sovereignty movement in other, uh, other parts of the world. And so that kind of attention, um, you know, fine grained analysis of the economic relationships within also this concern about, um, uh, about uh, ecology, I think is is very inspiring. So these are just some examples of the kinds of things that I'm seeing um, that people are doing that um, that's a, it's a very different from the kind of more static, more emphasis on harmony um, 
that we see if, if we're just reducing it to something that can be diagrammed um, like an ecosystems diagram. So to wrap up, um, I just wanted to, um, again, thank you so much for, um, for inviting me to present here. Um, and this has given me an opportunity to think about my work in the context of what the um, Making of Modern East Asia project um, is doing and all the great scholars who are working collectively in that project. Um, I hope perhaps my work could make a um, modest contribution to, by offering an understanding of historical actors' theories of infrastructure, i.e. their systems thinking for one place in East Asia, that is the PRC over a number of decades, and reflecting on the political implications of those um, theories of in infrastructure. Um, the flip side, you know, of course, um, how can insights produced by um, the larger project deepen my analysis and broaden its significance? There's a lot here for um, me to aspire to um, in the work that you all are doing. Um, certainly um, striving for a deeper and more meaningful materialist analysis. Um, this is always something that I know I need to do more of. Um, I tend to shy away into epistemology at the slightest excuse, um, and I know that I could do more to um, deepen my engagement um, with the evidence about the material world itself. Um, certainly a better accounting for daily life. Again, um, I am um, looking forward to trying to do better um, with that. Um, and then exploration of China as a part of East Asia. This is a real weak point in my work. And, you know, I will say a little bit in my defense, you know, that we're always having to define our, the place that we're looking at and the connections um, that we decide to emphasize and whatever decision you make opens up certain opportunities and closes off other ones. Um, I have chosen um, typically the PRC as my kind of unit of analysis mostly I think because I continue to find socialism very interesting and that d definition allows me to keep that, um, that emphasis. Um, but um, then also in terms of the connections that I look at, I have tended to focus on Sino-US uh, connections much more than other kinds of connections. And in part that's because in agriculture as in some other fields, the US-China relationship is so extremely central that it, I think it would actually be inaccurate not to center it. Honestly, I, I do think it would be. Um, but that's not to say that these other um, relationships aren't important. And so um, the, you know, uh, thinking other, other people have, uh, have done the, the work much better than I have of, of looking at the relationships between China and other places in East Asia. And that's something that um, I know I need to learn from you all to, um, to do more of. So, and I'm sure there are other areas that you can, um, you know, you can suggest to me as well, but I will stop there and uh, really look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a stimulating and interesting talk. I mean, there was so much chock full information and amazing diagrams. And I, in particular, really enjoy the ones that you hand wrote yourself um, to think about uh, the different ways in which we engage with text and systems theory. Um, and so I uh, please, uh, for everybody who's listening in, pose your questions through the Q&A. There's one questions at the moment right now from Angie Becker. Uh, who says, thank you for a very interesting talk. And her question is, how much was labor accounted for in the agroecological models you've looked at from the socialist period? Looking at the lines themselves that connect the various dots in the diagrams, I'm wondering if the thing that is being transferred is more flexible than fixed, i.e., as you pointed out sometimes, the line is energy from pig manure, sometimes it is money, could it be sometimes a human labor? I'm also interested in the fact that much of the research you shared came from around 1960, just a couple of years after the Great Leap Forward was announced and while the famine was occurring, but nonetheless a period in which the labor of social reproduction was being rethought through the collectivization of domestic labor, as in communal kitchens, sewing circles, childcare, et cetera, albeit these were short-lived efforts. Uh, there are several other questions. Would you like me to go through all of them first, or would you like to take one at a time? Um, let's see. Maybe we could do one at a time just for the beginning, and then we can start clustering them if it feels like we're not getting to enough questions. Okay. Um, 
So this is, and this is a great question. I'm not going to be able to do justice to it, except to say this is, you know, definitely something I want to look at more. The diagrams themselves, I have not seen um, to focus on or to account for labor. It may be that there are diagrams out there that have labor um, included in it that, that I have not um, considered. Well, with the exception, I guess, of the um, a character charter, um, because that, you know, the labor is one component of the eight, um, uh, uh, Mao's eight character, um, charter, but that's a, you know, that's, that's a very, that's a different kind of, of systems diagram entirely. Um, but, but labor is definitely, you know, a part of the larger study, the larger discourse, the larger kind of research agenda, um, certainly during the Mao era, you know, also um, later. And, you know, you'll, that's something that I have noticed is that it is a, um, there is a, an integration of that piece um, and that I think uh, testifies to a kind of interdisciplinary understanding of what needs to happen in order to address uh, rural production that also, you know, uh, we see as a continuity in the interdisciplinarity um, of the agroecological um, studies in the reform era and in the agricultural heritage movement as well. So labor is definitely a part of that. Um, the lines being flexible rather than fixed. I'm definitely, I just need to think about that more because I think that that is, um, that's really interesting. And perhaps part of what I need to do is a more, a deeper analysis of the relationship between the diagram and the accompanying text, to what extent there are hints that the diagram is itself being interpreted in more um, flexible way. So I'll, that's all I'll say for now, but I, um, I'm really, I'm, ex I'm excited about this question and I'll, I'll keep thinking about it. Thank you. Um, our second question comes from Juliet Tempest. Uh, thank you for this timely presentation. Could you please speak more to the role of systems thinking during the Great Leap Forward? You demonstrated that ecological approaches to agriculture predate the Maoist era and formal systems thinking. It would seem that the adoption of systems thinking then represents a certain aspirational modernity. If you agree that systems thinking reflects modernist aspirations, how can we understand the application of these modes of thought in light of the disastrous consequences of the Great Leap Forward? Great question. Actually, I've always uh, imagined, I've always been waiting for people to um, call me on the lack of Great Leap Forward um, attention in the Red Revolution, Green Revolution book. I really start, most of the analysis starts in the um, period immediately afterwards. Um, and I think there's, there's, there's much more that can be done with the Great Leap Forward itself. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, the modernist aspirations of the Great Leap Forward, I mean, part of what makes the Great Leap Forward so interesting is that, you know, in many ways, it was there, uh, in terms of the aspirations, it's extremely rational and extremely interested in, in modernization. It's, you know, it's interested in all kinds of things that then um, in most areas, although not all areas, don't come through, you know, aren't, aren't successful. Um, and then in terms of the analysis of, you know, what went wrong in the Great Leap Forward, you have people saying, you know, not enough planning, too much planning. I mean, you have both of those, right, as, you know, as reasons for, uh, you know, why the Great Leap Forward happened. You have, you know, um, we've highlighted often, for example, the close planting. Um, so close planting is actually one of um, Mao's um, eight, you know, areas that um, he wanted emphasized, you know, in, in agriculture. And we, you know, often look and, and mock that one, you know, as something that, you know, is irrational. But actually, if you look at it, there was a rationality to it in that um, traditional uh, decisions about how far apart to plant um, uh, did, was not taking into account necessarily um, the uh, developments in the breeding, you know, and that these, you know, were bred to produce more with, you know, more fertilizer, et cetera. And so there, it, it you know, it was often, um, I think, you know, a problem, but it's not necessarily irrational in its, um, in the thinking that went into it. So I would, that, that's where I would, I would start to approach this question is that um, the systems 
thinking um, is definitely a part of this. And yes, it's, um, you know, a part of the aspirations um, to modernity, whether we can blame that, um, which I'm not sure um, the question was meant meaning to blame it, but um, I'm just going there with my head, you know, whether we can blame that then for the outcome, um, I would want to think about that in the context of all of these other ways in which we um, identify either lack of rationality or hyper rationality as like the problem um, in the Great Leap Forward, which I think often ends up not giving us as complete um, a picture. But that's a that's a great question. And I'll keep you know, keep looking at that. Um, I think Angela had a question. Uh, yes, I, I'll just can I, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I um I you know thanks thanks a lot for this great talk. I, I learned so much and and there's so much that I that I haven't you know read and uh, uh, I don't, that I don't know about this topic and I it's very stimulating. I'm going to read a lot of read the articles that you have cited. But one question that came to my mind is um the uh, uh, you know, when I look at your graph and when, when I listen to the various models, um, I don't seem to see um, the factor of disease. Um, mm. How disruptive or, uh, is disease factored in, in this system thinking? You know, the one thing that, that, kept, uh, that I kept on thinking about is, you know, the schistosomiasis mm. mm -hmm. uh, epidemic in the mm -hmm. 50s. Um, I mean, that, how would that affect the formulation of the system? Or, or um, is it something that was a consequence of the system? Or was it something, or, or was it a system that was ma uh, uh, not sufficiently um, conceived? Mm -hmm. Was it part of the system? Right. Yeah, this is very interesting. And I don't, I can't think if I've seen specific example. So disease of plants is definitely a piece of it, especially for the, you know, integrated control um, of insect pests things. So that's, that's there. The place that I would go to look for this, which I will do now that you've asked this great question, is um, in the um, Zonghe Leong um, uh, uh, area around um, using wastewater for um, for aquaculture and agriculture, and you know I would say um, again thinking about Josh Goldstein's brand new book. I mean I think it like I haven't even gotten my copy yet, but I think it's like now that it's coming out. But he um, you know looks at how uh, waste, including um, you know. Uh, what do you call it, night soil, right, is uh, transported out of the cities and into the uh, countryside for, for agriculture. And so it's part of this Zongho Liyong concept. But in that, like, you know, I think the, the one that I quoted that said, or I cited that said um, that, you know, what's exciting about uh, the new work, um, and this is also in the 60s on, um, taking wastewater and using it for aquaculture and agriculture is in part that it integrates um, public health along with urban administration, um, agriculture and, and aquaculture. And so if I look into those materials more, I think I might see how they're accounting for the um, disease question, right? Because there's the a public health um, piece there. Um, but of course, I mean, they're, they're also, it's, you know, it's dangerous, right, to take wastewater and use it in agriculture, but it's also an opportunity, right? So it's um, a question of how they're going to um, factor in what, um, you know, what happens when you bring those systems together. But on the flip side, not paying attention to it or not, you know, you have to do something with that waste. And it's not like it's not, you know, having the potential to create disease. Um, if you're even if you're not using it in agriculture and aquaculture. So yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm sure it's there. And that's the first place I'll, I'll look for it. Uh, and, and also, I think um, about disease, um, the, the in the system when you have humans and animals together, that also is there's a risk there, right? And and now mm -hmm. we see that risk. 
And I wonder if that, I don't know whether that factor was also being considered in late imperial systems or in, mm. or in the current system. That's so interesting. Um, yeah, and I haven't, I haven't done enough to know that yet, I don't think. Um, and then nothing is, the, the, the examples aren't coming to my head yet. Um, what, but one thing that just came into my head that was, this is purely anecdotal, but it's really stuck with me because it feels really significant to me. One time when I was doing field work um, and I was traveling around with some people and we were being hosted um, in this place that had this lovely reservoir um, and we were encouraged to eat, the, they were getting fish out of the reservoir that we were eating and it was so, it was said to be so clean that we could eat the fish raw. And the logic was that because there's no industry around that the fish would be you know, safe to eat raw. And in the back of my head, I was thinking, I'm not so sure about the industry piece because I'm seeing human habitation right around the reservoir. And my concern is the biological piece more than um, the um, industrial piece in, you know, in terms of eating raw. That's that would be what I would be concerned about. And then right after I had done that, I went and I was visiting with um, friends, like villager friends of mine um, and, um, you know, sitting around their table and eating and ask, I asked them, you know, whether they would eat raw fish in that situation. And they said, no. And I explained the logic and they said, no, you know, the reason you can't eat raw fish is because of the um, microorganisms from the, you know, from the toilets, like that's the problem. Right. So for them, they, they were really clear on that, but, you know, in this other context of really promoting, um, you know, eco agriculture, it was presented in this very different way. So again, just a random anecdote, but it's one that has really stuck in my mind, because I feel that um, that question of human animal um, interaction, it, it, to, to my mind, it spoke to how well the villagers had either through their own experience, and probably also through dissemination, right through um, being educated on this through public health campaigns, had really understood that risk. And though they lived, you know, completely together, I mean, their toilet is in with the pigsty, right? Nonetheless, like they're there, or because of that, they're extremely careful about boiling their water and about not eating raw, um, you know, foods that would be raw and, and in, in contact with this. Um, so yeah, um, I, I, I'm interested to know, like, who is who is thinking about that connection and who isn't? Um, and then, you know, what is their relationship to agriculture and to academic circles? Because it's not necessarily the people who are most academic who are thinking the most about that problem, um, just given that one experience. But yeah, I, I need to look at that. Thank you so much, Angela, for that. Um, we have another comment uh, from one of our collaborators, Francesca Bray. Uh, Francesca says, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. In terms of China in modern East Asia, South Korea might be a fascinating comparison. Samuel Undong, later peasant-led eco-movements, etc., with strong state ideology, but presumably deliberately distancing from, though in many ways comparable to, evolution in PRC. Um, I'm not sure if Francesca would like to elaborate or if you'd like to comment on it, uh, but uh, there's also another question. Oh. I um I can't comment on that yet except to say thank you. I'll I'll get right on it. <laughs> I really appreciate the suggestion. So thank you. Okay. We also have another question from David Edwards. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I will ask, I would like to ask whether you have any reflections on the quote surface as the basis for systems thinking over time, i.e how and to what extent the underground and the above ground have functioned in system thinking over time. In my limited uh, engagements, environmental scientists in China have said that they think their discipline has a tendency to focus on quote, horizontal surfaces rather than on e.g. the subterranean. Oh my, I wonder if, is it worth trying to dig up this wonderful um, image? Um, I'm not sure I can do it elegantly enough um, without just losing, oh, now I've maybe 
you're still there with me, right? Okay. No, I've, I've almost lost it with trying to, to switch windows. So I, I don't dare to do it, but I actually almost included. So the Masha Jun um, article where I picked the eight character charter, because I just thought that was the most, that was the biggest stretch in terms of using um, a systems diagram to describe something. So I thought it was the, the best evidence, but actually he has another Another one I was thinking of using um, has this lovely above ground, below ground um, uh, diagram showing the different parts of the plants um, and the different um, kind of ecological um, pieces. So the um, so everything that's happening in the soil and everything that's happening, you know, in the air and the root system and the leaf system, and then including also the um, pests, the different kinds of pests that are um, affecting those different um, parts of the plant and the different ways that the um, uh, control mechanisms work on those different parts of the plant. So it, um, it would just be a, a good thing to look at talking about um, above and below. I wonder about this actually. I mean, that's a great question, but soil, you know, if, if, if any of the aspects or elements of um, agriculture is has been most emphasized recently um, in China, it, soil is the one, like I, keep, I see it everywhere. And when I've asked people, oh, why are you emphasizing soil rather than say, you know, water or insect pests or, you know, any of these other things, you know, they'll say, well, soil, you know, soil's the, that's the key one. That's the central one. That's the important one. And so I wonder whether, um, you know, maybe what I'm seeing is more emphasis on subterranean to be consciously in order to make up for a perceived deficit, or maybe it's um, that you're hearing people, you um, you know, self-criticize about the lack of attention to subterranean, um, which might actually be evidence as to how much they actually do look at the subterranean. This, this, the self-criticism can always, uh, you know, be taken in either direction, right? Either it means that, you know, you take it at face value and say that they're not looking at that aspect or you, you know, think of it as evidence as to how much they are paying attention to it. But, um, but yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll definitely look into that more. Um, it's a good, it's a good way to think about it, I think. Great, we have another question from Izu Hu. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Did the historical actors in Mao era and early reform era differentiate between system, quote unquote, the entity or research object, and quote, systems thinking, the theory or thought? I noticed that the examples you selected use links, integration, system, but not systems thinking. Very good. Um, yeah, systems thinking is my own word, um, for sure. I mean, it's not my own word. I didn't make up that word, but I, I'm saying that's, I'm, it's, an, it's an analytical category and not an actor's category. I'm trying to think if there are exceptions to that. Certainly, um, the word system even isn't, it doesn't appear as much in the Mao era sources that I'm look, I've am look. i looked at so far um, as compared with, you know, the you know beginning in 1975, that's when I'm starting to see much more emphasis on that. Even that um, the article um, by Zhong Gongfu that includes that systems diagram that's like just becomes the exemplar for all of this um, later on, it, it, it doesn't use a lot of, it doesn't even say Xitong, it uses Zhidu and it doesn't even use Zhidu like particularly often. It's not like talking about the system so much as it's representing um, a systems analysis. And the product, it's really about production links. It's about integration. Um, you know, so Zonghe is used all over the place. Xitong or even Zhidu is not um, used nearly as much. Um, so yeah, it's, that's, I'm, I'm imposing that on um, as a as an analytical category on that history until the um, really said around 75 when it becomes um, a very clear actors category. Um, I should do more to um, not only to make that clear but also to kind of probe the significance of that. I mean, I think in part it beca it's because that's when. 
um, there's all this enthusiasm about engaging with systems theory um, that is, you know, has been developing um, in uh, the West, in the Soviet Union, and that there's like all of, there's more explicit um, direct engagement with, specifically with systems theory, as opposed to with just kind of the systems thinking that comes out of a Marxist dialectical approach to um, looking at parts and wholes. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I think. I, I'm, I'm, I'll, uh, I'll definitely want to probe that more deeply. Thank you. And there's a follow-up comment um, saying that because around the same time period, Japanese engineers and some technocrats use quote unquote systems thinking very consciously. And so that's uh, more food thought for thought for you. Uh, in this right, period. I'm sorry, did said in, in what time period? It says uh, because around the same time period, Japanese engineers and some technocrats use systems thinking very consciously. Great, thank you. Um, if I may ask one final question uh, before we finish. I thought your, uh, your incorporation of Richard Levin's uh, ideas was really fascinating. And um, I thought it, it reminded, there are so many other questions I wanna ask, like thinking about Rosa Luxemburg and accumulation of capital also in this context, but I just thought, would you be willing to share uh, some preliminary cholerae examples that you thought about when you were talking about unionizing diabetes? Um, well, so I was kind of trying, I was trying to do that on the, those examples that I was drawing from, from other people. Um, and, you know, I think it's, you know, I, I need to spend more time with it. I was hoping that those would count, um, but I can't draw them. So I kind of felt like that was the part of, part of what I was thinking was, you know, if, I, to my knowledge, Dick Levins didn't draw draw it either. Um, so, but that might actually be um, for one thing. I have more access to colored pencils now than I ever have before because my kids are um, doing school right next to me while I'm working, um, and so that's part of the inspiration as well. But um, I could try to map out, you know, like following Dick Levins's. Um, example, like, what does that look like? How would you actually make that into arrows, just as a kind of thought experiment, right? And then how would, you know, how would I actually try to map out what I'm, you know, saying I'm, I, you know, if I say I'm inspired by Yu Huang's um, integration of the economic and the ecological, you know, would that actually be diagrammable? Or is it the kind of thing where it's not just saying, okay, so systems thinking thinks of it too small, and you'd need to, to, um, make the system a bigger system, or maybe it means that the diagrams themselves inevitably can't capture all of this. And that once you start drawing the arrows, you're not going, you know, there's, there's something that's um, going to be beyond um, that, um, that that's going to be a reductionist exercise no matter what. But I mean, reductionism is also a tool, right? And so we use that as a tool to kind of try and pin down some of what we're understanding. And then we blow it up again by saying, you know, this isn't, um, this isn't capturing X, Y, and Z. But yeah, so, so, you know, maybe what I would try to do is take, you know, something of what Yu Huang is saying about um, shrimp farming in um, southern China and try to to draw out what, like literally draw out what, um, what those, um, what the relationships are there. Um, and if it's not possible, then that also tells us something about, um, you know, what is and isn't possible with the kind of systems thinking that gets crystallized into a, um, a bunch of arrows. I think, you know, Dick Levin says you probably could do, right? You know, you could, probably could draw the interaction of these molecules and then, it, you know, the food part, you know, taking the break would insert somewhere and, um, you know, eating the snack would insert somewhere in there. Um, but I, I'm not sure about some of those other ones. Um, but those, that was my attempt to, um, those were the ones I thought of was the sugar, um, sugar production, not the blood sugar anymore, <laughs> sugar production, um, the um, ecology and um, economy, and then um, the integration that um, Vandermeer and Perfecto do in the nature's matrix, which is, you know, quite an interesting thing that they put together there. Great, thank you. Um, Angela? Thank you so much, Sigrid, for this wonderful talk. I think we all learned a lot from you. And, um, and also, we look forward to your your future book. I'm sure that we have a lot to uh, 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 to read, you know, in your new book. I hope that are you going to China anytime soon? 
Uh, oh my COVID? goodness, who knows? After COVID, as soon as I can, for sure. I mean, I was looking forward to going last year and then I was looking forward to going this year. I honestly don't know if that's possible or not, um, but you know, I'll be going back just as soon as I can. Um, I have, um, so I have if you, some people. If you do, 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 um, do drop by Hong Kong. Thank you so much. <laughs> and, and so, so that we can really, uh, maybe we can work together. Um, um, our institute, you know, after the MMEA, um, this project, we are trying to do something in the Greater Bay Area, and mm. um, and the um, environmental issue uh, is something that they are very very interested in, and mm. um, and I'm, and we hope that we could have we could have your um, input, uh, advice, and and on, on this new project the next time you come to Hong Kong. Well, that would be my pleasure and my honor. Um, I really, um, and so it's just been delightful um, talking with you all and uh, just such a great honor to be invited. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sigrid. See you next time. See you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.